Wonderful. Uh, so, Jonas, would you like to say a few words about yourself first? Yeah, thank you. Honored to be here. And um, so first of all, I'm a researcher at the Ratio since 2017 when I got my PhD in uh, environmental economics, basically. Uh, I was supposed to be a lot in, in Oxford, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, unfortunately, I can't be there anymore. And I teach uh, a little bit up in Luleå. It's, uh, it's way up north, I guess you haven't heard of it, and do some labor market research also. So I spent half my time on labor markets. So down the right, this kind of my latest book is More Than Times. It's about how to you know adapt to technology in the labor market. But uh, now I use mostly do research in different environmental fields. So a paper that I'm really excited about is coming out soon. It's uh, an anatomy of failure. So I've looked at uh, the wind power development in China and it's uh, quite bad. I would say they build a lot, but it doesn't work. And it's coming out in quarterly journal of Austrian economics. And uh, another paper is coming out also this year in journal of cleaner production is breaking circular economy barriers. So do a lot of things. Thanks, Christian. Turned out uh, central planning didn't work in China either. Interesting. No. Who would have thought? Uh, okay. So, um, I've been with Ratio or Ratio, both are, are good at pronunciations uh, since 2011. Um, my work is on digital business, industrial dynamics and, and innovation policy, which were the topics I talked about last time. So we'll just give you a, a few words, like a glimpse of, of uh, the Ratio Institute. It's an independent research institute, uh, problem oriented, Swedish and international. Uh, we publish in academic journals. We try to have an impact I think it's not unfair to call us a think tank in the Anglo-Saxon tradition. Uh, we try to combine relevance, out, uh, impact, and, and the quality. Um, and um, we aspire, again, like the IEA, to have uh, the audience for us is uh, a qualified audience of, of uh, policymakers, of academics, of, of um, what you would call the central zone of, of society. So it's uh, that's the, the uh, overall idea. Okay, Jonas, well, can you start give us an introduction to how we ended up with this book? Uh, it's all re it's in Swedish now. Do you have a printed copy there you can wave? Yeah, I, do. I have 10 of them in my bookcase to, you know, wow. when I have meetings to show off them. So it looks like that exactly as uh, the picture, I guess. The idea we got, uh, I think we both read uh, Andrew McAfee's book roughly at the same time. One and a half a year ago, it was named "More from Less," the surprising story of how we learned to prosper using fewer research and what happened next. Uh, so Andrew looked uh, at the U.S. and had, uh, I think, he checked 68 different resources and energy uses and saw that everything is really going down and it's going down quite a lot, and that's uh, quite positive. So we were thinking about how does this look like in Sweden. So then, uh, yeah, we ended up with a product which we call Mer för Mindre, which is roughly yeah. more or less. And uh, Andrew was kind enough to also read uh, our translation that is coming out later and gave us a little thumbs up there on the front page. Uh, next picture. Uh, so we are quite inspired by free books, I would say. Maybe Rusling, mostly we both read that also at the same time. So uh, the late... Uh, Hans Rosling was uh, looking at a lot of development economics and uh, the state of the world. And he found out that no matter if it was students, professionals or prime ministers, they knew nothing about the state of the world. So if we, even at Davos, if you ask a qualified audience, what is happening with poverty, child mortality, education, most people felt like you know, the world is getting way, way worse. And all the time, and the students say, you know, child mortality is going up, poverty is going up, and Rosling so that the, if we let a monkey, you know, choose A, B, or C, he will be more qualified than I, you know, uh, any Swedish university student about the state of the world. Mm -hmm. But we also read like Steven Pinker, who talked about how violence is going down in Europe, quite contrary to what we see maybe in the media. In the media, we say, you know, quite a bad picture. It's almost like I don't want to go out or go to work. It's kind of so dangerous in Stockholm sometimes, but not really. And uh, our friend Johan Norberg also released a book called Progress quite recently. So that's kind of 
or inspiration because we were thinking so if uh, people are wrong about how you know child mortality violence and other progress areas how is it about the environment and uh, we start the book with a kind of quite big chapter about you know CO2 emissions and we know that they are increasing and they are increasing with an increasing rate so you know globally CO2 emissions is of course you know going quite badly but we wanted to see you know how is it in Sweden what is happening here can we somehow combine economic growth and uh, CO2 emissions because that's you know a better environment because that's quite question I think uh, so we will only have one maybe pop quiz question, but uh, this is one we usually throw out to students and uh, they're mostly wrong. So, so if I would ask you, since uh, 1990, the Swedish GDP has increased by almost 85%, so quite a lot. Population is up with 1.6 million. So under that time period, the CO2 emissions has A, increased with 67.2%, B, increased with 1%, or C increased with uh, decreased with 28%. So you can, um, let's see, if you want to uh, press the interaction button. So, you know, the clapping hands is A, thumbs up is B, and the heart is C. Let's see if I can. Okay. We got some love in the air. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah, so the answer, I can come to the answer now. It's uh, minus 28%. So we can kind of see a divergence of CO2 and uh, economic growth. So, you know, even though we almost doubled the economy, still. CO2 emissions went down. And there's quite some you know, interesting reasons for that. So I can take next picture. So uh, here's just a graph of GDP and CO2 emissions. So it's a quite you know, good development that I don't think people really believed. And uh, I will later show that it looks kind of the same in the rest of Europe. Um, so here we have also graphed out just of pure interest this kind of a coming research project that we intend to do in the summer to look what is happening in Europe and maybe make a kind of similar book, but look at the European level. Mm -hmm. And as we can see, for example, the UK is almost the country that is best at you know, combining yeah, or at least decreasing emissions. So since 1990, the UK emission has gone down with 36%, 36%. And I wouldn't assume that you know people presume that just by reading the media it's of course legitimate to say this is not good enough but uh, i would say that you know if you increased your gdp with 50 percent from today in 10 years it wouldn't necessarily mean that you know your co2 emissions would go up and i think that's quite a, you know important things to take into a discussion mm. next picture so the first counter question we get, haven't you just exported the CO2 emissions to other countries, maybe China? And could be the case, but uh, me and Christian would argue not really. And we, we can send this presentation out to you, of course, later. Uh, so what we have seen, at least in the years that the Swedish government have good data, so sadly we don't have anything before 2008, then we have seen quite a large drop in emissions. So the foreign emissions and total emissions has gone down. And China is not really a big trading partner for Sweden. It's not small, but it's not big. It's smaller than Denmark. So we, our trade to China is roughly 5% of the value. So the UK is a much larger trading partner. And as we saw, the UK, who has cut almost 40% of its emissions, yes, that means that you know, our you know, impact abroad goes down and the European Union or Europe in general stands for roughly 80% of Swedish trade. And as we saw when the rest of Europe, you know, reduces their emissions, Swedish climate impacts goes down. Next, Christian. 
and then we you know continue to ask uh, students about questions. But here we have the results already. So even though you know the emissions or the number of cars went up with 1.2 millions, the emission from the car traffic in Sweden went down with 21 percent, which is you know quite amazing. And that's uh, kind of due to you know better technology. We have a little frame down there in the corner that shows that you know a modern car you can go almost three times further on the same amount of gasoline. And I remember you know my grandpa's two and a half ton old Toyota that took maybe one and a half liter to get ten kilometers. Now you can buy a car that's maybe run the same distance at three deciliters, you know, a fifth of the amount. So it has gone down. That helps a lot. Next please, Christian. Uh, same, quite surprising. The electricity use has gone up with 3% over 30 years, when, uh, you know, even though the economy has grown so much. And that's uh, partly explained by you know, technolog technological change again. So light bulbs that we have, you know, millions of millions of around here. The LED uh, light only uses 20% of the old lamps. So a kind of 80% reduction, and they last 15 years longer. Same as a modern fridge compared to grandpa's fridge, maybe uses roughly you know 20% also of the amount of energy. So it's quite amazing, Christian. Yes, Over to you. Um, I continue there. So uh, we looked at carbon dioxide and we looked at the natural resources like water, electricity, energy, and we see that they are, um, since 1990 energy use, electricity, water is pretty much the same while GDP has gone up 85%. It means you're almost twice as efficient. So what about pollution? Then? And then the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency has measured since 1990, 26 different uh, pollutants. And those are really bad guys. I mean, it's, it's cadmium, it's uh, here you get it in, in um, Swedish, but it's mercury, it's lead, it's copper, it's uh, zinc, it's sulfur dioxide, it's nitrogen oxide, um, those really horrible pollutants. And out of those 26, 24 of those have gone down. And here we have graphs for, for the other ones. So we have nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, we got carbon monoxide, um, and many others. So, um, you know, we got we got the this tremendous decline. Uh, here we got them all in one big table. Uh, the names I think you can you can sort of figure out. It's a table from the book. And the first column you got is uh, the change percentage wise. And then we also in the the uh, column to your right, we included we put it in relation to GDP as well. And a couple of things stand out here. So on average, the decline is 60% uh, uh, from those 26, 60%. And as GDP has increased 85%, the decline is in relation to GDP, it's 75%. Some of those are down like they're almost non-existent. Lead is down 97%, arsenic, minus 86%, mercury minus 74%. Um, and uh, catalysts and modern technology related to uh, uh, cars uh, have implied that those issues of sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, volatile organic compounds, uh, we see substantial decline here uh, all over the place. Okay, Jonas, would you like to continue there with, with some of those uh, illustrative examples of, of why this has happened. Yeah, I, I really kind of love these pictures, especially kind of the Coca-Cola jar. I think that's one of the best examples. So we have kind of digged how much did a Coca-Cola jar weight back in the days? And it has uh, happened quite substantial since the kind of 1959 when Pepsi started to use them in Coca-Cola. They were almost 80 grams of aluminium for those jars. And uh, today they have gone down to around 14 with this uh, kind of introduction of this little bit, you know, taller. I don't know if you have it in the UK, but uh, now our, you know, cola jars are not fat and chubby. They are quite tall and that saved 
almost 18 percent of the aluminium and that's maybe you know it's a two to three grams that doesn't sound much but uh, considering that uh, on the planet we use i think it's 180 billion jars every year so it's quite a lot and the same kind of a reason why ikea is competitive is that they kind of figure out a more sustain you know i don't think ingmar kamprod thought about sustainability a day in his life i don't know maybe but the fact is that you know just packaging it in that way transporting it in a you know cheaper way for the company was quite sustainable instead of using big boxes so i will almost argue that you know for a firm to survive they have to you know economize on resources so you know being a good firm is to some extent being sustainable but uh, the same we have seen it you know we just had to bring in ikea as one example yeah. sorry about that we yeah. just had to. <laughs> jonas continue please yeah same story about I already told them, I guess, the, you know, the lightning, the cars, it's quite a lot is happening. So it's uh, quite fascinating, you know, a positive story. And I don't think we have reached the end of the story of technological development and research use. If you just take a, you know, a modern cell phone, looks like this, it contains, you know, tons of materials in the kind of old days. If you have, you know, a man came with, you know, this old VHR cassettes and kind of hopefully some books also in the mag it came a big TV that was you know at least a meter in width big stereo you know everything is in that little thing plus all the books that has ever been written I can read in this mm. so it saves quite a lot of materials mm. so um, here we have some of the uh, underlying factors um, if we go back to this issue with uh, what, what Hans Rusling was into that people know very little about what is actually going on in the world. And we have a very limited idea about the, the improvements that take place. Question is, is something similar happening here? Um, I think we were both, Jonas, surprised when we saw some of this data. Uh, and those, you know, when, when it comes to air pollution, when it comes to these examples, um, and, and I think we are technology and market optimists, but, but we were surprised. So uh, we're going to look further into this, but we, we did send out a survey to uh, a couple of uh, directors at a large industrial firm in Sweden. So we only had 33 respondents, um, and we asked some of those questions that, that Jonas covered here. Um, and... Uh, I'll show you what, what they said. So here is the, uh, the question is in, in Swedish where we're asking what about uh, uh, emission of greenhouse gases from, from cars uh, during this time period when, when uh, uh, the number of cars went up 1.2 million? Did it go up? Uh, the, blue la the blue one is up. And the right answer is there was a decline in greenhouse gas emissions from cars in Sweden during this time period, which is the, the red one. And one third got that one right. That's not too bad. One third got it right that there was a decline. Now this one um, was energy consumption in, uh, no, sorry, electricity consumption in Sweden, where the blue says that it increased. And 70% uh, said that electricity consumption increased during uh, this time period. Uh, and nobody said that it had gone down. And some people said that. So th this seems to be a similar pattern here as Rusling detected with you know, infant mortality and war and famine, etc. People don't know of this. Um, OK, so. Right now, we are in the stage with, with this mer för mindre in Swedish, and it's more for less question mark. Uh, the book has uh, some 60 graphs where we cover various facets of this. Um, and uh, pretty much everything has become better over this time period. We've had a fair bit of media impact in, in, in Sweden. Um, some people appreciate this message when there's been so much doom and gloom covering sort of the entire environmental debate. Um, others, not the least in academia, say that, you know, we, we are um, 
belittling the, the problems by making these kind of statements and that uh, you shouldn't be so optimistic. And it's like, well, we're not trying to say whether the glass is half full or half empty. We're just saying how much is in the glass and how much was in the glass 30 years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, there's been a combination here of um, technological advances, continuous rationalizations in the economy as, as Jonas described, and also legislation and regulation that has been uh, imposed, uh, considering, for instance, the ban on, on lead. So uh, with that, um, I would just briefly sum up here with, well, yes, it seems we get more from less. Much remains to be done with regards to CO2 emissions. But we see resource utilization has improved. Uh, we see considerable improvements with regards to air pollution. And we also get an impression that the knowledge about this throughout society, in industry, among policymakers, is actually very limited. Um, with that, um, I hand over to you, Syed, as that finishes our opening note here.